This Sunday, September 8th at 7 p.m., Jazz Winnipeg will be kicking off another great season of Sunday Night Jazz at the Fort Gary Hotel. Some of the country's best musicians will be take, taking to the stage to bring Winnipeg audiences the absolute finest in live music. The first concert of the season features former Winnipegger and jazz guitarist Aaron Shore. Aaron has been an active member of the Winnipeg jazz community for nearly a decade. He has studied at Humber College in Toronto, the University of Manitoba, and privately with international jazz icons like Jonathan Kreisberg, Miles Okazaki, and Bruce Foreman. He is just coming off his 2023 debut album called Owens Creek that features reimagined standards, pop tunes, and original music performed alongside Julian Bradford on bass and Kevin Waters on drums. This is going to be an amazing show on Sunday night. And joining me here over Zoom to talk about his upcoming performance at the, at the Fort Gary, I am joined by guitarist Aaron Shore. Hey, Aaron, nice to meet you here over Zoom. Hey, great to see you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said in the preamble, you were super active on the Winnipeg jazz scene for many years. But now you're calling Calgary home. Why the Correct. move? What, you, what drew you to Calgary? Uh, well, actually, my partner Kirsten is originally from Calgary. Um, she, uh, we met in Winnipeg just prior, kind of just prior to COVID, and we started seeing each other then. Um, and it was, uh, she sort of felt like moving back to Calgary, and I wanted to check out some new opportunities here. And uh, so we just, we just decided to move. So I've called, called Winnipeg home for many, many, many years, but uh, it's been one year in Calgary now and we're having a great time and I'm meeting lots of great musicians here and getting to know the scene here as well. Oh, fantastic. Uh, one of the things I always find really interesting when talking to jazz guitar players is finding out how they chose to pursue jazz guitar as a passion. Uh, you think of young guitar players, they want to be rock players. They want to be the next yeah. Van Halen or Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, what flipped the switch for you? Is there a player or record that made you want to become a jazz guitar player? Well, actually, I should start out by saying that I wanted to be a rock star. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I grew up in the, I started playing guitar, I guess it would have been the late 90s. So grunge was kind of still on the way out. And like, <laughs> I was listening to Nirvana and Green Day and, you know, around the home, we had a lot of like, my dad has a very, very eclectic collection of music. Mm -hmm. So we also had like a lot of Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, classical music, jazz music, a lot of blues. Uh, so there's a lot of music in the house to check out. Um, but around, I guess probably the end of junior high, grade nine, I started just, I was really into Stevie Ray Vaughan, like lots of suburban guitar playing kids. Uh -huh. um, and kind of there was uh, Steve Ray Vaughan had a tune on the record. I, I might get it wrong, but I think it was The Sky is Crying on that record. Mm -hmm. And it was Chitlin's Con Carn. And he was like kind of this more mellow, like uh, uh, bluesy, minor blues thing. I'm like, oh, this kind of sounds like jazz. And I, you know, I was at that time, I was already into checking out album credits. So I was like, oh, this is written by Kenny Burrell. Well, who's Kenny Burrell? Uh, Oh, Kenny Burrell's a jazz guitar player. Oh, cool. So I got a couple Kenny Burrell records. I got Live at the Village Vanguard and I got um, Ode to 52nd Street. And I started listening to that. I'm like, oh, I kind of like, I just like how this music sounds. It was resonating me, resonating with me in a way that, you know, a lot of other music hadn't, it hadn't done that before. And then, uh, and then throughout high school, I just met more like, like-minded you know, music nerds and fans yeah. who are into jazz and like, you know, my, my uh, palette and my musical world just started to grow considerably. I was still playing like a lot of rock and blues stuff through that time, but I was getting really serious about like learning how to play jazz guitar. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I've downloaded your album, Omens Creek. Uh, it, I put it in the system here at the station. It is really lovely and an intimate disc. Uh, from what I understand, you enjoy playing in a jazz trio format. Openness uh, is, I think, the word that you used on the Calgary Jazz Collective website. Can you talk about that? What kinds of freedom does playing in a small uh, group give you as a guitar player? Um, that's a really great question. Um, part of it is I really like to have, 
I mean, I mean, the the one caveat to that is I'm playing in a quartet setting at mm -hmm. the Fort Gary, so I'm playing with it's gonna I'm gonna have piano in the band. Carter Graham's playing piano, so it's a it's a different that's a bit of a different gear. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, I. Uh, have always loved a lot of saxophone trio records, like a lot of Sonny Rollins, um, uh, a lot of the Sonny Rollins trio records, Joshua Redman trio, um, J.D. Allen, to name a few. Uh, I really like that kind of openness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I like the lack of actual harmony. Oh, yeah. um, and like to, I like to be able to fill it up when I, sort of when I want to. And, um, and the way that the rapport that Julian and Kevin and I have had to quote together is we've, we sort of have found a thing where we don't have to have a lot of actual harmony to go on for the song to, or whatever sort of piece of music we're playing to mm -hmm. get across and for the dialogue to happen. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons I really enjoy it. And also part of it's out of... Um, out of necessity, a lot of a lot of the times, all that rooms could afford were to have a trio. So right. you just get used to you get used to playing in that format quite a bit, and it's a it becomes a source of comfort. It becomes a very comfortable vehicle. Yeah, it's very intimate, and it's almost like a, you get this, like you say, a conversation happening between the three players, yeah. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas, I mean, if in a quartet setting where I have piano, it's like I'm a little bit more locked in in the sense that i can't necessarily just choose to take super large harmonic risks just when right. i feel at the drop of the hat because <laughs> someone else is covering that right um and also i just i really enjoy playing with carter and um and for this gig i just i i'm just playing some, some new tunes that i haven't played before and also just playing some some tunes that I've always wanted to play, and I thought that the quartet would be a, a fun a fun mm -hmm. format to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask about the disc. Uh, okay. The disc, is, the disc is named Omens Creek, and I'm presuming yep. it's named after Omens Creek here in Winnipeg. Is that right? Correct. Oh yeah, correct. Uh, what can you tell us about that tune? Why did you call it Omens Creek? I'm presuming it's it's an original tune, right? It is an original tune. So the original tune had a different title uh, that I didn't like. And, and for musicians, for, well, for jazz musicians who are writing instrumental music, sometimes titles are very functional. And sometimes they really are, they have a place, uh, they really have a source from um, uh, the initial inspiration or an initial context, somewhere where you were when you wrote it or a feeling or a person or a word. Um, the initial title was actually, they're, they're both functional titles. So um, I had a tune that needed a title and yeah. I spent a lot of time living in Wolseley and I used to walk through Omens Creek all the time. I'd take many, many walks through there. And I love that place. It's just, even though it's really small, but it's got this vibe that I really like and it's, mm -hmm. it was personal to me to the neighborhood. And I actually always wanted to name a tune Omens Creek but it didn't happen. So I was like, well, I have this tune, it's kind of a ballad and it's got this kind of vibe. I think that that title could work. So that honestly is it, it's not that romantic, <laughs> but, uh, and then when I needed a name for the record, I thought, oh, that also works. Yeah, yeah. That also works for the record. I had, you know, naming can be kind of a difficult process for, yeah, right. for us. And it's, it's, it's such a great tune. Uh, the, the Omens Creek album consists of seven tracks. Can you talk about sort of the, lay, the layout uh, of the album? As near as I can figure, is it original tunes that start out and then we get the sort of more uh, standards or? Oh, uh, I'm trying to go through the track listing in my head. Um, no, actually it starts the other way. So the first tune, Chi Chi, that's actually a Charlie Parker composition oh, that wow. we reimagined. We sort of... Uh, Collectively, as the trio, Kevin, Julian, and I came up with this like 12-8 Afro-Cuban kind of groove that worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is only a couple days before we went in to record it. Like, we were a bit loosey-goosey in terms of what tunes and what arrangements they were going to be. We really just wanted to go in and capture like the vibe of the band, mm -hmm. which is often how trio records like that, or a lot of jazz records are made that way. They're just snapshots. Right. Um, Sometimes there's there's moments that are really arranged and planned out, and sometimes they're not. So, 
that tune, there's Chi Chi, which is Charlie Parker, and then Fantasy, which is actually a tune by the R&B band uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Ah. You know, <laughs> you know their famous hits are like September and Sing a Song right, and right, right, Serpentine right. Fire. And uh, But uh, Fantasy is like just a, a song I always really loved with really beautiful harmony. And I just, to me, it kind of just worked in that context. And that's actually a tune where the arrangement is very like, planned out. It's oh, not open. Okay. Everything is very set because it's just the way it worked for that song. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I think was Omens Creek, the title track. Um, and then we get, uh, how do we get here? How do we get way? here? That was another, that tune came, came, I wrote it very quickly. Um, and I was kind of thinking like, Hey, I wrote this song really quick and it, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think I wrote it maybe 2016, 2017 around there. So a lot of that material is like, it's almost a decade old now. Mm. Um, but, um, I was kind of just trying to think of some sort of paradoxical phrase that didn't work, uh, that would work as a title. So yeah. how do we get here is like a grammatically incorrect, <laughs> like, oh yeah, okay, that works. And oh, oh, and also the groove is not that intuitive for us to learn. Like I wrote it out, I had an idea of how it was supposed to sound. And then as a group, we had to like really learn how to make it work. So that's mm-hmm. another, you know, another place that that title came from. And then after that, how do we get here? And then you've got a couple of standards. If you could see me yeah. now and I've grown yeah. accustomed to her face. I've grown accustomed to her face. If you could see me now, um, that was just a ballad that at the time I was just really enjoying playing. So mm-hmm. uh, um, there was a really famous West Montgomery recording of that song from uh, Smoking at the Half Note, which is a really famous jazz guitar record. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just said, okay, let's just play it. And however you know however it lands it lands Mm -hmm. and then uh and then that was that and then the story for i've grown accustomed to her face was very similar i was just really enjoying that playing that tune i wanted to record it and julian and i just played it duo so it's just guitar and bass and then the Mm -hmm. last tune i think is designated hunter yeah so that was the one that the vibe of that tune to me didn't fit with the overall rest of the record uh-huh. so um i'm and i i get really particular about programming like the order the set order either for my gigs or for gigs and for recordings i get really particular about it and when i listen to records i'm always really interested in how they choose how the record will flow as a whole and that's for jazz records and like pop and rock albums as well and concerts I even really enjoy going on like setlist.com and seeing what like, oh, what was Bruce Springsteen's set list? And <laughs> like, I, I have spent hours like, you know, on that stuff. I love it. I really, really love that stuff. Um, so, uh, so I just chose to place it at the end because yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, it's a little bit different from the rest of the vibe. So maybe it can stand alone at the end. And that tune I wrote a long time ago, maybe like... <laughs> probably over 10 years ago. Um, And that was another one that needed a functional title. Like it was, uh, it reminded me of Dave Holland. And I was like, okay, DH, what's like a word you could put together out of those? (laughs) Yeah, there you have it. So not that, again, not that romantic. (laughs) Okay, so on Sunday at the Fort Gary, uh, you're gonna be joined by Julian Bradford on bass, Kevin Waters on drums and uh, Carter Graham on piano. Um, Yep. You've mentioned Carter before in the interview. Uh, can you talk about your friendship, friendship with him? How long did the two of you know each other? And can you also talk a little bit about Vox Populi? Oh, yeah. I'd love to. So, um, I'm trying to think how long have Carter and I known each other? Um, probably going on about nine or ten years. Carter's a bit younger than I. So, I think Carter's about, actually about that much younger than me. So... <laughs> Uh, nine or 10 years younger. I might be overestimating. Uh, he was a student at the U of M at one point and we, our paths kind of just started to cross through mutual friends and Carter was really interesting to me in that he came to playing music seriously a little bit later in life. From what I remember, like he was in his early twenties when he started to get like really serious about it. 
Yeah. Um, I hope I'm not speaking incorrectly or if Carter hears this, but I'm just speaking from my memory. Um, and he was just like a sponge. Like he absorbed so much music and he practiced so hard, so quickly. And uh, one of the very interesting things about him too is that he got just as into classical, or not classical, into acoustic piano, jazz, as he did into like keyboards mm -hmm. and electronic sounds and synths and deep R&B music and pop music and coming up with really particular parts and getting great sounds. Um, and to me, that's one of the reasons I really love playing with him um, is because he can kind of do all those things. Like he also, chameleon. he's a chameleon. He's a real chameleon. He also plays keyboards in the Paul Simon project that I have, the Still Crazy, the music of Paul Simon, and he slays it. So it's mm -hmm. like he can go and play and sound like Whitten Kelly or Herbie Hancock, and then he can go sound like all these pop, like piano guys and like yeah. get so deep into it. Um, that, and we just get along great. I like to yeah. play with people who, you know, we just have a great rapport with. We really like to hang out together we share you know very similar sense of humor um yeah. that's like almost everyone that i play with on a regular basis that's that's like mm -hmm. a quality that will attract me to it's like it's not just about the music it's also about how do we sort of get along as, yeah. as human beings and so he's going to be joining you on stage and you and you mentioned it uh, in passing how playing alone as with guitar it gives you you have a little bit more freedom harmony wise how is it different playing with Car uh, with Carter on stage? Like, I just think when you have piano there, it can help thicken up the harmonic uh, texture. Do you two plan that plan that out? How does that work? No, it's not. I mean, stuff is planned out in the way that, like, say if I'm handing out a tune, I'm band leading in this case, so yeah. I'm the one handing out the tunes. Um, the chord changes are written into the tunes yeah. and mm -hmm. you know there's always possibilities of places that they can go but when i have someone playing when i have carter playing keys or piano or anyone else say i'm playing with will or i'm playing with will bonus or I'm another great p any other great keyboardist or pianist it's like they might take risks and it's up to me to be able to kind of hear where they might be going with the harmony Mm -hmm. and be able to respond to it. For example, it's like if they're playing, if there's a minor seven chord and they actually choose to play it, like they might play it dominant or they might put a flat five in it because yeah, it works. About nine, ninths and thirteenths. Like, yeah, yeah. Know, and it, it's it, like it, if it, I hear that, I might be able to respond and fit that into what I'm, I'm playing. Yeah, and also just how they're fitting into the groove. Like mm -hmm. it's just another like component to the groove. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and that's that's sort of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to get to what audiences can expect on Sunday night. Are you going to be playing uh, Omens Creek in full and some standards? Uh, can you talk about the set list a bit? What's that? Oh, going? yeah, I'd love to. So actually, uh, in May of 2013, we did an Omens Creek uh, release show at the Fork area. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm always kind of of the mindset. It's like once you release something, you sort of set it free and it's you know, it takes on a life of its own and it gets to the people it gets to and it, you know, um, and for this gig, I'm actually, I'm playing almost, uh, yeah, the tunes of mine that I'm, I'm only playing a handful of tunes of mine. I don't think I've played them in for Winnipeg audiences before. Mm. So, um, I may have, but I don't remember totally if I have, and then I'm playing, um, some great jazz sort of underplayed songs from the jazz repertoire that uh, I've always wanted to play. Like I'm playing a tune by Joshua Redman, a tune by Bobby Hutchison, um, a Charlie Parker composition. Uh, there'll also be a tune by Stevie Wonder and a tune by the Beatles. Uh, and then I well, almost every gig, I usually play a little bit of solo guitar as well. So oh, wow. there's probably going to be some of that. And then um, I think that's that. That's so that to me, from a musical standpoint, that's what the audiences can can expect. Very, very, very. Yeah. And what uh, What do you hope audiences are going to take away from uh, the gig on on Sunday night? Um, I just hope they have a great time, and I hope that we take them somewhere that otherwise they, you know, uh, take them somewhere new. 
you know, they spend their hard-earned money and put on their shoes and go outside and come hear us and, you know, really want to make that worth their while. And more than anything, I want to leave the audience feeling good and feeling like they really uh, heard something that moved them and then, you know, just that they have a great time. That's really what I want. Yeah, and, and the Fort Gary uh, venue is, yeah. is great. It's, always, it's a really, really nice room. I'm, it's great that Jazz Winnipeg has, is uh, partnering with them. They've done a fantastic job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Aaron, this has just been great meeting you and talking about the show. On hey, Sunday yeah, likewise. At, at the Fort Gary at 7 p.m. All the best. I'm sure it's going to be excellent. Uh, and thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Hey, so my pleasure. Good. My pleasure. Yeah. For our Classic 107 listeners, Aaron Shore performs this Sunday night at 7 p.m. at the Fort Gary Hotel. For more details on ticket prices and how to purchase tickets, go to classic107.com. I've embedded a direct link to the show pass page in the article, and you can find that there. Aaron, thanks again. Thank you, Chris.